I have some very mixed feelings on Gears of War Judgment. Much like the Gears fan base, I find myself in a love-hate relationship with this game. People like when there are changes to their games to keep things fresh, but it's the kind of change that matters. If we're talking a more gradual change over time, like say, expanding on the abilities of the core gameplay, say for example, you know how in Gears 4 and 5, if you're running towards a piece of cover, it gives you the option now of being able to hop over that cover and keep running, or staying put. And I think this is a very good change. You could keep running afterwards, keeping up with the pace of intense combat for the game, or you could stop to give yourself a moment. But change I don't like, and that I assume most people don't like, is massive sudden change. A type of change that affects the core gameplay in more ways than one. Such as the change of the entire weapon system, and that's just one of the changes that has affected both the game and the players alike. So much that Gears Judgment, in comparison to Gears 3 that released two years earlier, only sold a little over 400,000 copies within its first few months, compared to the roughly 2 million copies from the third game. Now yes, the third game would probably sell more in any case since it was a known Microsoft classic and it was the end of the trilogy of the franchise, but to only get barely over a fifth of copies sold within the same amount of time after release really says a lot. And that's kind of sad, because there are things about this game that I love that really don't get as much light. Its story had a great premise, the characters had somewhat more of a presence in the story, there were some new weapons, and there was even a new game mode called Overrun, the one thing Gears fans really give this game some slack for. Epic and People Can Fly did everything that they could to really shoot themselves in the foot on this one. Some of these changes could have been good, but for each one that there was, there was also a downside to it. The structure of storytelling changed, but it starts to feel very arcadey. They added free-for-all as a mode, but they foolishly took out Locus as a playable faction. The pace of combat is a bit more hectic, with its enemy choices and placements making a lot of these encounters feel like Wave 50 of Horde, yet the choice of enemies doesn't always make sense or is just entirely too frustrating. They say hindsight is 2020, so even though we can look back and see the positives of this game, it's much harder to not see the overwhelming issues from this game. So that's what we're going to be doing here. We're going to identify all the bad and all the good by going through every aspect of this game that it had to offer in 2013 and see if we really needed a Gears of War Judgment or not. We can just go ahead and get into the obvious, which is the weapon system. For each of the Gears entries previous to this one, the weapon system was on the D-pad. You had two primary weapons, a pistol slot on the bottom, and a grenade slot on top. Now in Judgment, you have two weapon slots and a grenade slot. They took away the pistol slot. They did decide to keep pistols in the game, however, any pistol you find now will take one of the primary weapon slots. This change was much more detrimental than it leads on. There are times, and this isn't even just Judgment, literally any other Gears game, where there will be certain enemies you specifically want to and are better off using your your pistol for. If there is a Rager, a new enemy type that we'll get to later, you'll want to kill them with the headshot, something the Snub and Boltock were amazing for. Or killing Tickers, Wretches, Shriekers, whatever. Another personal use of mine, if there's a Flame Grenadier, you know how they have that explosive pack on their back? Pistol is a great weapon for shooting those. They were just good to have as a third weapon all around. If you're running on two power weapons or just end up running low on ammo in a pinch, your pistol was extremely reliable. But that reliance wasn't heavily noticed until they decided to take it away. Back to the D-pad change, since they removed the D-pad system, the way you switch weapons now is by pressing Y, and a way to get your grenade out is by pressing and holding LB, giving it the COD treatment. Now if you just tap LB, it just lobs the grenade. I think this is what had me the most annoyed while playing through this campaign. There's a lot of times where I want to know where my enemy team is by using the TATCOM, or have slightly better vision through smoke, and instead of using my TATCOM, as LB has been the button for this in the past three games, I end up just throwing a grenade in my face. Also, having to hold LB every time you pull it out is just awful. I don't even think there's a toggle option for it. You know how in other games, if you have to hold a button, Sometimes in the settings, they let you decide on holding or tapping. I wish it would have let you at least equip the grenade by pressing LB, and then while it's equipped, use the same normal aiming system that we're used to. But instead, we have to hold down LB to aim the grenade as well. It isn't a change I expected to have such an impact, but when there's built-in muscle memory of players from the previous three titles, this is what happens. They also added a mechanic, if you throw a grenade and it hits an enemy, it'll stick to them, which is all fun and shit until the enemy charges at you like a suicide bomb. You're also able to aim your grenade from cover, which, while this doesn't make any sense, it's kind of nice to be able to aim without getting shot at. And now using the TATCOM is down on the D-pad. It just feels like such an unnatural button to use. It gets annoying having to second guess every time. There's also another thing that I don't see mentioned at all, and it's the way that the grenades are thrown in this game. They're now thrown with the left hand in this game if you just tap LB. Like the known trajectory of throwing a grenade feels off here, and it felt like I had to get used to another way of throwing a grenade. Now see, if these changes were things about gears that were already in the game in some way, or if this gameplay system was already established or being established, like 
like gradually like i said earlier then i wouldn't be complaining and neither would the fandom like as its own besides going down to two rather than three weapons the system is fine it's not terrible but since we had established controls already this massive change just feels like it threw off the gameplay entirely it started to feel like the game should have just been really called gears of duty instead they also took out weapon swapping i didn't remember to talk about it before but in gears 3 you were able to aim at somebody and ask to swap a weapon i love this so i could steal a sniper or something off of my teammate in a campaign but now there isn't a weapon swap system like they couldn't have just brought that over i don't know why that was left out was it forgotten about when it came time for this game i know it's a small mechanic but why remove it i'm not trying to use a nasher outside of multiplayer so i need to be able to pawn it off on one of the others now there was also something that just blew my mind for this game and it's using shields since there's no pistol slot for you to automatically switch to you can just use whatever weapon you want while using a shield meat shield or boom shield doesn't matter you just won't be able to scope in if you're using a weapon with a scope like the lancer or the mark so that we'll get to later but a lancer and shield is impossible in any other game except for this one i don't dislike this change it just feels very strange to me as we've already kind of had a built-in rule of as in you only use pistols with shields i always just assume that they never use primaries with shields because a pistol is just easier to wield and reload with a shield so it just made sense but since they made that change and wanted us to be able to still take shields we got this goofy looking ship so there were a lot of new additions to this game that people did enjoy many of which aren't even in future titles which is kind of a bummer but let's talk about the weapons first so first we've got the marksa a medium range semi-automatic sniper rifle from the uir with decent damage and a scope kind of rivals the long shot in terms of use but shoots faster and does less damage it also holds a fair amount of ammo making this a pretty reliable weapon for headshots or some quick damage next we then have the bushka a junk rat type of grenade launcher the blast radius seems pretty small to do any real damage unless there are balls here away from it unless you get direct hits which even those still aren't enough for a kill sometimes hitting bank shots with it is probably its best use for it and probably the most rewarding thing about the weapon there's also the tripwire crossbow you'll wind it up like a torque bow but as the name suggests you'll want to place your shots on entryways as it'll trigger an explosion once an enemy crosses you also can't place too many at once it kind of acts like the grenade system you can only place i think three or four at a time lastly we've got the breach shot a locust modified marksa that instead now only has four rounds to a chamber but they're much more powerful shots higher difficulties this thing will kill you in two shots doesn't matter it also no longer has a scope but it's much easier to get headshots with as it's typically one or two shots to get on most enemies this is by far my favorite weapon in this game getting a headshot with this weapon just feels so much different than the rest of the headshotting weapons even compared to the long shot it feels like a better weapon to use to me maybe just because you can get headshots quicker with it it's at least more enjoyable and you can kind of go on a headshotting streak with it and once again i hate that they left this weapon out of future titles speaking of the breach shot let's talk about the new enemy type that uses these weapons which are the ragers these enemies which i assume just went extinct as we've never heard of them besides this game although i guess i may be wrong since they appear in the aftermath dlc but i can talk on that later in the video for now ragers start as these scrawny goblin looking dudes with breach shots that if and when they take a certain amount of damage they'll transform into this spiky red hulked out motherfucker that loses its gun and charges at you for only melee attack which hit hard enough to break through armor and break your damn spine in half all while yelling like a taylor swift fan seriously they yell so damn much one section of the game is just one giant ear rape but we'll get to that later you're also able to prevent these guys from transforming either with a grenade on them a chainsaw or just a clean headshot otherwise if they do transform your best bet is aiming at the head as that is still a weak point for them there's also therons with butcher cleavers i'm just gonna these dudes have theron armor but they're using butcher cleavers something you've never really seen a theron supposedly higher up amongst locusts really do before yeah i don't know why they're here i thought the point of them using cleavers in the third game was to show that this is what they've resorted to instead of torque bows but they're here very recently after e-day they were introduced in the first game as elites that specifically use torque bows so i was really confused as to why they're using cleavers here not only that but they're also just annoying as hell in a couple sections of this game there were also a couple new grenades added there's now the stem grenade which is only given to you a handful of times throughout the campaign and the spotting grenade which is only usable in survival and overrun at least i never saw it in a campaign not like it would be all that useful in a campaign anyways so the stem grenade is a pretty nifty addition if you or your teammates have taken any damage or gone in down but not out the stem grenade will rejuvenate your health entirely and can even pick you back up i think this is a lot more useful than the game even makes it out to be this would have been really cool to be able to use more throughout the game or hell even in future titles would have been cool too as for the spotting grenade i mean i don't think i need to explain this one now i know i just said not five minutes ago that i didn't like the change from carrying three to two weapons however what i did like in this game was the level of difficulty and variability it provided and taking away a weapon actually kind of helped in that regard there were just a few tweaks that made the combat in this game more volatile, more sporadic, and just more chaotic. Besides the one button swapping mechanic, there's also a new enemy swapping system and an added difficulty challenge called Declassified Missions. But let me explain why these missions are even here in the first place. The way the story is told in this 
game is very distinct from all other Gears games. Baird and his squad, Kilo, find themselves on trial for supposed treason. The man trying you commands you all to tell him the events that led to their eventual treason. Each chapter of the game is split up into each character's testimony, and each of those characters have several sections. As you play through their respective chapters, they'll be voicing over the section telling their side of the story as you play it. It didn't sound like the most glamorous mission in Health Bay. It wasn't supposed to be, Lieutenant. At the start of each section, there will be a red omen on the wall somewhere in the area that you can interact with. It'll show a report-like description of the situation that you're about to encounter, and also just what the effect of the challenge is going to be. Each time you accept the mission, they'll voice over describing the situation in their testimony. I heard other units talk about the glowing wretches, but I thought that was just soldiers telling stories. Turns out it's not. If you refuse or ignore the mission, they just won't say anything. Along with this challenge system, they also added the star system, which was basically arcade mode, but permanently for the entirety of the game's main story. The way you earn points in Gears 3 arcade mode is the same in this game. Just now, those points accumulate into three stars per section, and earning a certain amount of stars gets you unlockables, like Ty as a playable character, who I don't have yet, as well as the Aftermath DLC. Turning on a challenge in any given section would then make you accumulate stars quicker, because the challenge adds a difficulty multiplier. So basically, you you can choose to declassify the details of these missions they went on or not. And these extra details that they always could decide to leave out were always things that made their experiences just that much more difficult. In the past games, it was very linear in its gameplay, and the only thing that gave it some spice were varying enemies as you went from one game to the next. But within each game, the set of enemies were the same for each encounter, and the way you played was most likely bunkering down and shooting from a distance while advancing. I did mention many times in my last video that the game's newer enemies were what changed the combat a little bit. Having enemy AI be more aggressive, most all Lambent require you to not stay still, and even newer Locusts force the same out of the player, like the Digger with a D or the Serapes. But in Judgment, we don't have Lambent and all those newer enemies, so they did something different, which were the challenges and the enemy swapping like I mentioned. Before, if you died or played through a part multiple times, you would encounter the same enemies every time and they'd be in the same positions each time. But in Judgment, that just isn't the case. With the exception of a few scripted missions, every encounter typically had two different encounters you could play through in a single part. Say for example, in this encounter, encounter, I was fighting Therons and Wretches after I died, which, as you all know, certainly happens more times than not. The next time, I'm facing Drones and Flame Grenadiers. Or here, I'm initially facing Serapedes and Ragers. The next time is Blood Mounts and Heavies like Maulers. It was changes like this that made sure you never really got comfortable with whatever playstyle you have. You will, in some way or another, need to switch up how you play in order to proceed in this game. I love that it shakes it up each time around, so no playthrough feel the same. But when you're dying multiple times over on a given part, because let's face it, it happens to all of us, it just makes replaying a little irritating. In the past games, if you die to a gunker, then you know what you need to do the next time around. Avoid that bullshit ass knife of theirs. But say here if I die to a blood mount, there isn't any correction I can make. Now I'm facing serapedes and ragers, so I don't get the opportunity to right that mistake. Or just get the chance of a redo, because now there's new enemies here. However, if that's upsetting, or you just don't like a certain set of enemies, then you can just restart the checkpoint like I did many times on this part especially, that we'll most certainly get to later. There are even different weapon drops for encounters as well. There's this section on one playthrough, they give a long Long shot and next time they'll give a one shot. So not only will your gameplay decisions in the battle be varied, but so will the resources available to you at given times. It seems like they would try giving you a weapon based on whatever enemy set there was at the time for balance. I don't know how effective this was because a one shot is probably more effective than a long shot. Back to the bigger change, those are classified missions. These challenges added something to the Gears of War campaign experience no other Gears game has accomplished, even as of now. In Gears 4 and 5, we have the inconceivable modes, which are grueling as hell in their own rights, but these challenges were different than just upping the the damage you take from enemies. It added more variability, replayability, and more of a challenge to get through. We'll get to that variability thing in a second. Insane before was just strategically choosing the right area to be in in order to get shot less. But now we got challenges like, for example, one is not being able to see two feet in front of you. Enemies that attack you are ones that are dangerous up close to deal with, like Therons with cleavers, wretches, maulers, and so on. I will say it was a little annoying if you want to use certain weapons on a playthrough and you come to the challenge of having to use only shotguns or pistols. There'd be many times they took away a fully loaded sniper or breach shot I had on me, but it was cool how it forced you to play through whatever events that they actually went through while on these missions of theirs. Every time they said they ran out of ammo from fighting for so long or had to prepare for more intense locusts because they're getting closer to the end added to the immersion. Before it felt like Marcus and squad could just really blitz through anything that they wanted to in front of them, but here you feel that these different encounters had a toll on these guys, especially with the missions towards the end of the game. This also helped with another problem the Gears games have. In judgment, these declassified missions make what they did from a story and gameplay perspective 
perspective a bit more believable. Like Delta and Gears 1 were fighting for at least an entire day, and they never once experienced how tired they were, even by the end in the train section. But the last couple of missions with these guys getting tired and not being able to recover or losing eyesight from taking damage due to exhaustion was really cool, not only because it makes us feel through the gameplay how tired these guys actually are, rather than just hearing it, but also because it tweaks the core mechanics of the game. Not being able to recover health at all isn't something we've seen before except for the vampire mutator in the third game. There are also a few downsides to these declassified missions as well. One is that it makes the story feel very arcadey like I mentioned earlier compared to the other games. Not being able to return to different parts, losing weapons as you switch characters, and always having those stars on made it feel like that. Every section is about a couple fights long until you get to a completion screen and then have the flow interrupted and are told how many grubs you just blew up. I like seeing progress but god it was after every single section. Maybe if it was at the end of every character's testimony that would have helped a little bit. There would be someone on a countdown within a story and they all just stand here waiting for you to come up and end the mission. The downside were how repetitive these sections and missions got. These were the timed missions, the horde light slash protection missions, weapon force missions, or vision and pairing missions. The timed ones didn't really provide much of a challenge other than just trying to stress you out with a timer on top of your screen. Most of these are easily finished with some time left over but I always felt like I was going to run out of time so I never explored most of these areas. The horde missions sort of fit, they were just always massive onslaughts of locusts attacking and these missions sort of feel like they're meant to be played in co-op. There's barely enough time to search the entire area and set up in time alone and just had to deal with the sometimes overwhelming numbers of locusts and sometimes you had to protect the bot. And having to do these horde missions every single testimony was just super annoying. They always had to defend some area or something and what made it worse was while the enemies were growing in numbers and difficulty the equipment and resources went the opposite way. For some reason as you get further in the campaign you just start having less and less defense for when it's time to start actually defending against all these locusts especially blood mounts like why? Other than those things I think I like the declassified missions for what they were. They not only gave a better and varied experience difficulty wise but they also do really well for the story. Gears 1 you had Marcus and Dom if you were player 2. You never got to play as anybody else in the other games except for being able to play as Cole in the third game. But in this game not only does each character get the chance to speak through their own testimony they were also able to have their own dialogue for each mission. For each mission you accepted they each said something explaining the situation. This was very nice for characters like Sophia and Paddock since they're new characters to us. I can't say it really added much for Baird and Cole because they already had personality through the past few games but they've always been in the back so it's really nice to see them in the light here. The dialogue is something very much worth mentioning for this story though. It honestly might have some of the wittiest humor between each of the games so far. Probably entirely due to Paddock though. I just love this dude. They made him likable, funny, and extremely cold. He's a major from a nation called Garaznia that was a part of the UIR who the COG was at war with just a few weeks prior to E-Day. He and Garaznia were hit hard by Karn and due to the growing locust threat he decides to join the COG through the open arms program yet he still got his own personal gripes with them. It's pretty cool seeing him interact with the others considering his background especially with Loomis. Loomis is the colonel here trying Baird and his squad for disobeying orders. His hardened sense of loyalty and what's right clashes with Paddock and Baird respectively. Sophia was also a cool character. She's a cadet of the Onyx Guard Academy and got interrupted with Ide before fully becoming one and she gets shit for it a few times throughout the story. No you're not, cadet. <laughs> So we've had Horde in Gears of War 2, Horde 2.0 and Beast Mode in Gears 3, and now they decided fuck Horde and Beast Mode entirely, let's try something a little different and mash them together so now we have Overrun and Survival. Overrun is really a blend of Horde and Beast Mode. Before if you played Horde you only played as the COG until the very end and vice versa for Beast Mode. But now it's more of a versus game mode where each team will be playing Horde or Beast. There are two emergence holes that are covered by the COG team and then a generator. The COG will defend each of these in a round for a total of three rounds while the locusts try and break those defenses. While the COG defend normally with setups like turrets and barriers, the locusts have more of an objective rather than just attacking and killing the COG like in beast mode. They need to break through and destroy the emergence hole covers to advance. The locusts are given six minutes to break each emergence hole and seven minutes for the last generator. And if they don't advance and overrun them in time, Hammer of Dawn strikes will come down causing that team to lose the attacking side and the teams will swap. So now the COG will be the attacking locust team and that locust team will be the COG team now. And now that new attacking team will have to beat the other team's progress. The teams will still switch sides if the locusts are able to push past each emergence hole and destroy the generator, and the opposing team will just need to do better than them but in a shorter time frame to win. For the locust side, it plays just like beast mode but with different sets of locusts to choose from. The only new one being the rager here. You can actually now activate their rage at any time, which is much different than what I thought it would be. I thought you would have to take a certain amount of damage first, like how they work in the campaign, but this is still pretty cool. But what's weird is that it's time, and they eventually 
eventually devolve back into their smaller form if you stay alive long enough. I never knew that they could do that. My impressions from fighting them in the campaign made me think that they also just couldn't do that and that they stay enraged. But I guess never being able to switch back after raging out for their race would be really inefficient. But then again, I'm sure there's a reason that they went extinct, supposedly. Cantus also play more like the multiplayer variant rather than the normal Cantus, but it still has the abilities like reviving and side dodging rather than rolling. He also uses the old hammer burst. I thought this was pretty cool to see. The others all have abilities that are what they're able to do, but on cooldowns. Grenadiers throw grenades, tickers can dash, wretches scream and stun you, and serapedes can rear up and spit at you. And maulers are also able to spin their shields and reflect bullets back at you. Now for the cog is entirely different. We now have a class system. Each class is tied to one of the members of Kilo Squad, and you can't change your character to play as Loomis or Ty if you want to. You're stuck on the Kilo Squad. It kind of sucks, but I don't think I mind it too much here in this game. There's the engineer, the soldier, a scout, and a medic, and they each play as Baird, Cole, Paddock, and Sophia respectively. They each have abilities, and certain weapons that make you play a certain style where cooperation is kind of needed from all roles for the whole team. Baird will have a repair tool and a Nasher with the ability to deploy a sentry for a limited time, which then it'll just go away and you'll be on a cooldown to bring it back. Cole will have a Bushka and a Lancer and his ability is deploying an ammo box that refills a couple times and also has a cooldown. Paddock has a Marksa and a Snub and is able to scale certain walls for height advantage, but also has a spotting grenade. Then there's Sophia with a Lancer and a Sawed Off and she has a Stem Grenade. So there isn't a down but not out state like the old games they just kind of die and flop to the floor but if you aren't gibbed or just your body doesn't get destroyed then you can be brought back even with a stem grenade i like the class system here it kind of forces a team-based gameplay with this mode because you can't really get this done by just having four coals i mean maybe but having a revive and a sentry turret seem pretty useful survival is just honestly the same as overrun but no one plays as the locust it's just holding out as the cog for 10 waves the locust advance in the same as it is an overrun destroying the holes phrasing and eventually the generator and if they make it that far, then you'll have to start all over, not being able to start over from the wave that you failed on. Most people played Overrun, and it was the better of the two game modes, especially since survival is actually kind of hard. There's fucking grenades everywhere, and they just abuse the hell out of them. And like I said, once you fail, there's no restarting. With it only being 10 waves, meaning no boss waves, I'd rather just play Overrun or go play Horde on 3. Or hell, even a story mode essentially had you doing these ad nauseum. This just feels like a waste of a game mode, and I felt so bored playing it just for this video alone. I didn't even care to finish all 10 waves and I died and I wasn't about to start over again. Multiplayer games for years now have had at least some customization aspects to them and for the most part would improve and add more that you can customize with each entry moving forward. This had been the case for the Gears franchise from just a small roster of playable characters of maybe no more than 15 in the first game to well over 50 in Gears of War 3. They even started letting you have customizable weapon skins more than just the occasional gold in the third game as well. This is an amazing addition to the franchise as many other games are doing this around this time as well. So by the time we get to Gears Judgment, the last thing you would expect them to do is take away all the Locusts as a playable faction, which is practically half the roster for multiplayer. Why they decided to do this is beyond me. To barely make up for this, they added the option to customize your gear armor, something you probably couldn't do for the Locusts, I imagine. Much like customizing weapons, you could put skins on your armor for each character, like Chrome or the skeleton skin I see most people use. I just ran Luma's Chrome with Chrome weapons. I actually enjoyed this myself, although this is the only game we'd be able to do this on. They also put some skins mostly behind loot boxes, but here they're called prize boxes. I think you just got them from playing the game. What sucks is that besides the COD type changes, the multiplayer side of things was decently fun. The maps featured all this verticality, which we've never really seen before in most of the multiplayer maps before. Most maps were pretty flat, and now we've got maps like Gondola being able to use, well, a gondola. And there's all different angles which you could take from higher ground, and it's pretty well made. They also gave us Free For All, another aspect of Call of Duty they decided to grab. But this one was a nice one to have. There were, however, only a handful of maps, and it got very stale very fast. And seeing how multiplayer was how I spent most of my time in the Gears games, and with Horde being ripped out from under our nuts, I didn't spend much time with this game outside the main story. But we first opened Havo Bay at 9 p.m. to help out those weird people who don't like military time for some reason. Also, I don't know if they explicitly say in the story itself, but this takes place just a few weeks after E-Day. There's a massive smoke cloud and fire in the distance, and a couple helicopters pull out and land, and out steps and handcuffs four people, including Baird and Cole, who we can recognize. He asks to go see if someone's dead, and he's told to keep moving with a gun to his head. The four of them are escorted by some Onyx guards, and a couple other guards notice Baird and talk shit about him, and the mean man with the gun tells them to mind their dead business. Baird sees a city getting ruined by the locusts and is shoved inside, with the man in charge clearly trying to ignore that threat. 
Okay, so they're uncuffed, but in a ravaged courtroom with just some onyx in here. Loomis slams his bull talk and tells them they essentially don't have the right to shit. No right to an attorney, nor can they ask why they're even getting this shit in the first place in the middle of what seems to be a big ass battle going on outside. He then says the verdict will be fair and swift, just about as fair as this tribunal is. He then says that he'll define what the charges are as he hears everyone's testimony and he passes the mic to Baird first and he starts from when he saw Loomis last. And while I go through this story, I'm going to include the challenges as part of the story, even though they're technically optional. From my perspective, I think it's supposed to be that these classified missions are just what these characters could choose to put in their report or not, but they still occurred and you can just play through it as if they didn't happen. I won't go through every detail, just what really stands out and what really applies to the story, or just upsets me. This journey starts with Baird's team being volunteered to help out a convoy. Really, Loomis just told him to go do it. Baird mentions he's heard stories of glowing wretches before, meaning glowing wretches must have been around for a very long time before we even saw them in Gears 1. Which does make sense because Anya did say that people have been reporting that before they arrived at that facility. It's amazing that these wretches didn't mutate the way everything else did in Gears 3 if they mutated because of the emulsion's life cycle. And it's doubly crazy that these lambent wretches in this game and the past games were never shot at by other locusts. This is sort of a tangent, but imagine the buildup we would have had from Gears 1 if we saw a couple lambent wretches get shot by locusts, hinting that they, one, were already at war with lambent, considering that's why E-Day happened, and two, that the lambent would prove to be a more lethal threat in the coming days. But instead, we never really saw the locusts and lambent wretches shown together, and even when we did, they didn't really attack each other. They only cared to kill us. But in Gears 2, we see lambent locusts now fighting regular locusts. I think if we saw them, even just a small interaction in the first game, it doesn't even have to be a scene, just mid-gameplay, you see locusts divert their attention to a couple lambent wretches rather than just letting them pass by, as if lambent don't care about locusts when they're the ones getting mutated. That would have given us just slightly more build-up to the height of the lambent conflict in the third game. But anyways, he tells Loomis that the convoy has been destroyed, and Loomis says to head to the Museum of Military Glory. He says whatever took out the convoy is probably still around, and Loomis doesn't care. Our first sign of Loomis being an unwavering, self-righteous prick. Something in this game and other Gears games fail for me is the seriousness and the mass amount of casualties from civilians and soldiers alike. If this was a city and it's getting decimated, shouldn't we see a lot of dead people around here? Even if they had evacuations, there are a lot of Gears dying too. Yet we don't see many around. We do see some later in the story. I just feel like we would see a lot more dead people around here. They arrive to help some Onyx guards and they tell them to just watch here since everyone just died in the east side of the building. And they tell Sophia she ain't shit because she's really not Onyx yet. So we enter the main hall and have to defend and this is your first of very many horde missions. It's essentially light horde mode with set defenses and a couple auto turrets you can set up. There's ranged and shotgun ones that both have health and both need ammo refills every now and then which just suck. Like I get it, it makes sense. It just always comes at a shitty time and finding a place to put these always felt like more work than it felt like it was intended. And throughout this entire segment you can hear the Onyx who left you to defend really start getting their asses handed to him over the comms. So after defending this area, from the sound of things, they decide to go over to the East Wing to keep aiding those feckless Onyx guards. Also, this next section's challenge is kind of a waste because by the end of the game, most drones are using lancers by that point, and they're not like the Cyclops from Gears 2 with pinpoint accuracy, so it didn't really feel like much added difficulty here. By the time they make it there, most have been wiped out, and these other Onyx leave to help and ditch us to defend yet another area. So this is the second time we're seeing that Onyx guards really don't mean shit anymore. Those ranks or that elite status of a soldier that existed during the Pendulum Wars doesn't really mean a single thing to these locusts. They're pretty much the same as anyone else now. Another thing I like that we're getting exposure to is seeing how differently everyone was thinking during this conflict, as this is a different time period. When those useless Onyx have you defend, a challenge here is also to defend Nassar Embry's armor on display. Baird says he decides to protect the armor to preserve some history, and it's just crazy that this was his mentality on it now. And he even says in present time at the trial that it probably wasn't even worth the trouble. This takes place right after E-Day, so I liked being able to see what their mindset was at this time before the conflict unfolded to how we know it as now. We don't really have much within the games that tell us how the events following E-Day took place, so it was cool and kind of sad seeing that he actually cared about preservation here before more destruction from the war came. I bet a lot of people were a bit more optimistic about this unknown threat before shit really started hitting the fan, especially Loomis, who we'll touch on later. They go underground to avoid the boogeyman outside, and Baird finds out that Paddock actually knows who the boogeyman is. They avoid some serapedes, fight through a room that someone really forgot to dust clean and make it to the other side. Baird relays to Loomis that the boogeyman is rocking everyone's shit right now and he just dismisses him and tells him to kill him and to keep defending. Paddock even interrupts and states that his name is Karn and that he practically demolished everybody in Garaznia. Sophia suggests a light mass missile and he does not miss a chance for a smidge of misogyny and dismisses them all while the comms die, signifying that Karn is nearby. They all then peer outside and witness the onyx fall, pretty brutally, and Cole is just like... So, how's that 
Problem is a work. Sophia tells him that there's one in Halvo, and the inventor, Professor Elliot, is at the Academy, her Onyx Guard Academy. They explain how the missile works with emulsion, and Paddock reveals his scar is from one of those missiles. He says it's a huge explosion, but Sophia assures that this is a low yield one since the professor stopped working on it after a hammer of dawn strikes. Baird asks, How big is it really? Pause. And Sophia here acts as if she doesn't want to be involved with the plan as Baird and Paddock want to, even though she's the one who suggested it in the first place. But I guess her gripe is that it isn't approved, so that makes sense. But she still gets on Paddock in the courtroom. She's here commanding Paddock to show some respect for a country that burned half his face, stole their weapons, and then has him here arrested for treason while attempting to save them. I would be upset too. Some explosions happen outside and cause a six on a Richter scale, and this man Loomis acts as if he didn't even feel that shit and tells Sophia to continue. I'm an academy cadet. I had to see if my friends were alright. They supposedly took the sewers to get here, and when they get out, they see the academy being attacked and on fire. So we know her fellow cadets probably didn't make it. Cross the bridge with some broken ass reavers, and they find out the poison gas defense system was tripped, and they have to rush through. They arrive to the labs, and it's weird how the gas shows here in the gameplay, but then just disappears. I get it's because that's technically behind a challenge, but they could have made another transition scene with gas in it at least. This just comes off as a little lazy to me, but you know, whatever. They find the bot, and since the academy is an anti-cloaking field, you've got to protect it on a way out. While protecting the bot, someone in the area and a raven above is surveying the area saying there's a lot of locusts but no gears that they can see and they end up getting shot down anyway. Right after this I go to load up the next area and my game just stayed on the loading screen. A few minutes passed and I just restarted the game which worked and thankfully this wasn't in the middle of anything it just brought me back to that area but still kind of annoying. Alrighty I gotta talk about this challenge because it just kind of pisses me off. The challenge is playing only with pistols and what she says is that they all ran out of ammo and had to reach for their snub pistols making it seem as if they've always had these three weapons on them at all times and the pistol is just locked behind a damn challenge. Maybe I'm just being a bit bitter about the weapon change, but this sort of just felt like a giant slap in the face. I mean, they even could have just changed what Sophia says so that it doesn't presuppose them having three weapons while only being allowed to use two. Anyway, I, I digress. I'm going to be talking about these transition scenes a lot. Instead of coming to a checkpoint area to initiate a cutscene like normal, you instead have to look at your stats of the grubs that you just killed 30 seconds ago and literally in the room right behind you. I'm serious. The pistol section is right here. Walk like 30 pages is to the right and it's already the next section and then this section is just another horde mission with corpses and serapedes so that was real fun her testimony also just kind of ends it didn't really have a closing scene or anything it just ends after the battle and it cuts back to the courtroom i guess they have the bot so it's on to the next one back in the courtroom loomis questions paddock's allegiance and he taunts him and the onyx guards just start beating his ass unprovoked he didn't even say anything crazy also sorry i'm still thinking about the transition from sophia's testimony to now like did she just stop talking and loomis just like looked at paddock and started asking him next as if like he was just done hearing from Sophia like what if Sophia had more to say about her own testimony or her section Paddock then admits to potentially torturing POWs and Loomis questions why he even takes orders from Baird he then says that he I had, had an ulterior motive Paddock asks Loomis if he's ever been poor, and he replies saying yes, as his father was a school teacher. So you know that motherfucker was poor for sure. Sorry to the teachers that may watch this video, y'all really don't get paid enough. But Paddock says that this is one of the reasons why he wanted to go with Kilo Squad to see what really the rich mansions of Havel Bay looked like. The reason Kilo's here is to find Professor Elliot for those launch codes. Okay, there's more issues I like to talk about. Actually, there's a lot more issues within Paddock's section, but I think we'll get to that towards the final mission. But I noticed here that boomers don't actually have a reload animation. Like they've had reload animation before right I'll cut in one here from like the past games or something to try and confirm that but I swear these boomers are just shooting off as if they have eight boom shots loaded up like I don't ever see a reload animation I know these sound like small nitpicks it just seems extremely lazy anyway comms come back on briefly and we hear somebody at the airport getting rid of cedars as Karn it has three more with him and a soldier is asking for advice Loomis says just to push them back into the sea since they're just animals and he threatens another one of his own soldiers and we hear him die at the same time another instance of Loomis not caring about his soldier's well-being and thinking that he's the correct one in every situation. We're at another countdown section, and they weirdly gave this section a checkpoint just after killing a couple Kansas and drones. I don't know why putting a checkpoint here is necessary for a time challenge. There wasn't really enough to warrant a checkpoint here as there was only five enemies you had to shoot just beforehand. It just feels unnecessary, but I guess I won't really complain, because I did die here. Now this challenge I actually enjoyed. You're normally fighting whatever is in front of you, and rarely do these games have more than just wretches or tickers hitting you from behind. So actual locusts flanking you did actually provide a challenge 
challenge because you really weren't able to just stay in one place. And I know I've said that before, but like they actually pop up behind you or just in your fucking face sometimes. Now, what I don't understand is why locusts just hop out the ground like they did in Gears of War 3. They were always using emergence holes as far as we know up until their home gets flooded, which is what led me to believe that's why they started popping up out of holes in Gears 3. But they have them just hop up out of here in the prequel, maybe just because they're lazy again and didn't want to do emergence holes each time. E-holes also render some sections completely useless since you can just toss a grenade in there and it'll make things much easier for you. So maybe they didn't want that happening. But if so, then make the locusts appear in different areas. It's not really that hard. I'm no developer, but that doesn't strike me as a difficult thing to do. Professor Elliot's house is currently trying to shoot down a shitload of Reavers like a GTA military base. So Sophia suggests that they use the friends and family entrance in the back. Sophia's trying to act professional about it, but it's okay. I think everybody here already knows. Grubs are trying to demolish a house with mortar. So they stopped them along with getting rid of defense barriers and other cog defenses set up around the perimeter. So you arrive to Elliot's house and he's apparently canceled his own life subscription. There's a message being played over and over again and it's his wife calling and stating that the place he sent them to to keep them safe from locusts was being attacked as she's crying and blaming him and it cuts. That coupled with the locusts also bombing his house for at least the past several hours, it's no wonder why he made this decision. They question Sophia about it and she just says that she found out he had been married with kids and that she moved on. The power goes off allowing the defenses to lower and letting the locusts through so they need to defend the bot while it searches for the launch codes. I would ask how does the bot even know what to look for amongst what I assume is a very large database, but I'm good. There's already enough headaches in this section. And we're about to get into them. So we find ourselves at another horde-like mission, and we're given one turret and a tripwire in this giant-ass mansion with three massive waves of enemies headed your way. After the first two, the bot will come out in the main area since the launch codes are apparently in the mainframe instead, according to Baird. Don't know how he knows that unless the bot spoke to him in the seconds prior, but whatever, now he's out in the open, so defending him is much harder. Also, if you go to where the bot was before, his little connection stream was still there for some reason. I'm also just not realizing that the challenge prompt here for this section makes zero sense. The report part says that they needed to scavenge for flame weapons to stop powerful locusts, which is referring to the berserkers, which I'll get to in a second but the challenge part says locusts use one shots. Not only are these prompts not even remotely connected, there's only two one shots in the first wave. After that, there aren't even any more one shots. I don't know what the scenario looks like without the challenge activated, but if I get a chance, I'll go back and play to see what it is. So I went in on casual, kept the challenge off, and it's the same mission. Same enemies and everything, just without the one shots present. And with the challenge off, it actually spawns the flamethrowers here on the ground for you constantly rather than having to scavenge them, with only one berserker rather than two of them, which I'll touch on more in a second. Also in casual, lets you know where to kind of set up for these horde missions. I would have never known this before, but it doesn't even really matter because there aren't enough defenses to cover each section and you'll be running around anyways unless you're fine with getting swarmed. But while we're on the topic of this challenge, we should talk about the absolute horse shit that I had to deal with in this scenario. This is something that feels like it should be a bug, but isn't. So in past games, the way you use a grenade in down but not out was only if you had it equipped. If there wasn't one equipped, then you were just shit out of luck. But in this game, if you just have one on you, then you can let it fly at any given moment. This drone here has a nasher as he's downed, and yet when I come up to him, he explodes. I thought this was a bug at first, but it's just because I always observe whether the enemy has a grenade in their hand or not before approaching. But in this game, you have no real way of knowing, so your best bet at all times is never getting too close, which is annoying as hell and boring because you don't really get to execute many enemies if they're all just exploding on you. I'm not rephrasing that. The next thing were these enemies and your team's AI. You guys remember me bitching about the AI in the first game. I haven't really brought it up since then because I felt like they've actually been improving on that through the second and the third game. But here it feels like we took 50 steps back because these dudes don't do fuck all to help in this game. This section will either send a group of ragers, butchers, butcher therons, and serapes at you, or blood mounts, maulers, and cyclops with you with regular drones tossed in for both scenarios. I just decided not to deal with serapes and ragers, so anytime I died, which was frequent, I just skipped and reloaded again to avoid them because they're just pure bullshit. Blood mounts and maulers are certainly a difficult combo, but compared to running around constantly because your teammates just unload into the ragers or shoot the backs on serapes and eventually going down to butcher therons and leaving it all to you, it's just infuriating to deal with. They're both doable, but one's more painful than the other. I said before these missions make it feel like you really want to play these in co-op on higher difficulties, but this section really makes it feel like you need to, otherwise you're just going to have a bad time. So after I got killed by that drone with the magic grenade, the berserker spawned without flame grenadiers. The prompt of the challenge says scavenge flame weapons, and you obtain those from the flame boomers that spawn alongside the berserkers in this challenge. But on this run of mine, they never even spawned for me in the first place, so I was soft locked with these dudes. Sorry, might get arrested for 
for misgendering, these gals walking around and killing my teammates every 10 seconds. I walked around everywhere searching for anything that could set them on fire. I even found a secret ordnance room I had never seen before this playthrough, but not a single item in here does damage to them. Frustration isn't even a word that could describe how I felt at this time. This section takes forever to get through and is one of the more difficult sections of the game, so catching a soft lock definitely didn't make me happy. I legit just noped out and made lunch hoping they'd kill me in the meantime, but I got back and they were all just repeatedly getting shot by the other three AI here. Lastly, another problem that occurred, or well, it just occurs because it wasn't really a one-off thing, it happened multiple times throughout this section, is that when the extra drones or Theron start spawning in, they come in through these doors on the side that for whatever reason also have a door in front of them that they'll eventually break through. But for some reason, they could shoot through the glass door before the door breaks for them to come through. And I almost died from it because it was a bolt -talk. Those kill you in at least two or three shots. And you can't even shoot back in there. You have to wait until they come out to shoot them, but they can just shoot you. This section was just mind-numbingly dumb and a really big pain in the ass. Once they're done, they decide to just leave and his section just kind of ends too. Paddock also says maybe one day he'll come back and take one of the houses since no one's around to stop him. At least Paddock had a line at the end of his section. I don't think Sophia said anything. I think the section just ends after you finish that fight. Back in the courtroom, Cole starts to talk and they get interrupted again and Loomis saves Cole's life here and then disrespects him right afterwards saying crash ball. He seems to have a disdain for the sport as it was just pretend war to him. Less important. How are you finding the real thing? I've been more comfortable. Then unburden your mind. So Kilo finds himself in a locust boat somehow, and hold your breath for an explanation because you're not getting one. A general apparently gave Cole a tour of this highly classified place because he was such a fan of him. Also, I noticed Paddock was using the same weapons I ended the last chapter with, which was pretty cool to see, but it just sucks that I can't freaking take them from it because they took out the fucking SWAT mechanic. So the boat opens, and Jesus, I was not expecting a Normandy simulator. So this challenge had grenade traps set up everywhere around the beach, even in places you may not think to check. This challenge, along with the absolute mayhem they're all trying to stop you with, makes it feel like they're were properly set up to defend you guys from getting to the missile here. This section in general feels challenging enough fighting at a disadvantage like this in elevation and not knowing where the grenade placements are. You're gonna die to these grenades at least once, like this one at the top here. This one felt like a solid hit to the balls. I couldn't have predicted this one at all being here, as I thought being off the beach was a sign of safety from the grenade traps, but clearly these guys were expecting me to make such a mistake that I felt embarrassed for even falling for. I genuinely enjoyed this section though. It feels chaotic, like they're actually storming the beach, and it certainly feels like a struggle. Honestly, in reality, I think this is where they would have been stopped because these grenades are insane, but the plot must go on. This is a great start to Cole's section, it's just too bad the rest of it is extremely boring in comparison. The game also started dropping a lot of frames here too. There are a lot of times I tried restarting and that would help it a little bit, but it would still occur. And this is still even on a series S, X, whichever is the small white one and not the huge black one. Wait. So he says his or their plan was to just keep moving forward and they'll eventually run into the missile. I guess with a plan like that, how could anything go wrong? Now I will say the one thing you can always credit a Gears game for is its scenery. This just looks amazing. There's so much destruction. It's starting to feel like this war may not be in their favor. So they don't have these guys use shields for some reason when the challenge calls for it. They all just walk around regularly and Cole has to use a shield. It just looks goofy. It must be something with the AI and must not have been able to get them to use them. But then I look like the idiot here. Take an elevator up and Cole makes a good point. If there's so many locusts here defending the area, what if they've already gotten to the missile? Although his point won't even matter later. Activate the light mass and comms come back on at precisely this moment. Luma supports that the big Cedar is down and Baird is just not punching in the codes, but Sophia steps in and says they at least have to tell him. He hesitates but tells him anyway and Loomis dismisses him immediately. Paddock says he's got no idea what he's up against and Loomis replies that Karn really can't be much if he murdered a bunch of indies, and that definitely sounds like a slur within their respective universe, but hey. He then tells Baird to arrest Paddock, changes his mind, and then tells Sophia to do it instead if Baird says no. Marcus all of a sudden is here too, and he says that they need an evac down by the museum sooner than a chopper can get to them. Once they leave, they decide to seal the door from the other side, so locusts don't get through. My question is why the fuck were they defending this entire area but then just left the missile unattended anyway? Like what was their purpose in being here if not to stop these guys from getting the missile? Plus couldn't they still take the elevator that we initially took to get up here? I feel like I've questioned more things in this game alone than the other games man. We already know it's the end of the section so we gotta toss in another horde mission. Very fun. I don't know why these guys couldn't just leave the island. They actually had to sit here and defend. I guess they had to defend the missile but no one's even near the missile anyway so I don't know why that- never mind. The challenge here is one shots again but 
once again, a lazy decision of a challenge because there's all sorts of cover up here. Like you don't even recognize there are one shots in the field. They're so far away. Gave them some planted grenades of my own, clear them out. And now we actually see them steal a boat this time. And that's just the end of Cole's testimony. Come back to the trial and Loomis is just flabbergasted. Another explosion occurs and an Onyx guard tries talking to him and I'll just- You might want to consider postponing the tribunal. You might want to consider getting back out there and fighting, Captain. Sir, they're right outside. Then it'll be a short walk. This is crazy. I'm waiting on you. Finish up. They need to get to Karn so they can get the beacon close enough to him for the missile launch, and they figure he's back at the museum. So from here on out, you're facing a heavy amount of locusts. In fact, the next three challenges are all just extra locust resistance. So the supposed reason Baird gives is that Karn knows that these guys are close. I always have a slight issue with the player just having to assume through combat that certain things are happening. This is okay in Gears 1 and 3 because we saw Rom tracking them and hearing their comms, and in Gears 3, we see Mira constantly chasing them, even through Griffin's city, Char. Even in the Aftermath DLC, we'll see this as well. We don't know how Rom knew about their plans to use the bomb, but we knew that he knew. For Mir, we know that she just knows that we know that she's holding Adam. I'm sure that made sense. But with Karn, we have only seen this dude's face once, and we've yet to see him make any actual decisions or even interact with any other locusts. So if the game is telling us that these locusts are onto us, like guarding the Onyx Academy or Onyx Point where the missile is held, or here adding an extreme amount of locusts as we get closer to him, the game has done nothing to show us that the locusts have this counterintelligence to be doing this in the first place. It's hard for me to just accept that Karn knew they were planning to use this missile on him. Maybe if they had shown us even one scene of him hearing their comms like at the beginning where they were discussing this, then that would have at least added more context as to why there's more locusts at every turn, rather than it just feeling like they just threw in a shitload of locusts for the sake of gameplay. These things need a little more context. Now see, this is some added context like I was asking before. There are loads of dead people in these waters here, just slaughtered civilians. The gears also rarely speak on the death they come across too. I wish these gears had some sort of reaction to the mass amount of civilian casualties they come across. There's several dead bodies here and none of them say anything. This isn't the only time they come across a mass grave, but this is one of the bigger ones. I know they've probably seen mass graves before, but it's only been a few weeks since E-Day, so unless they have aphasia, their collective silence here is just weird, because this is a lot of bodies. It would really add to their perception of the locust's savagery, seeing mutilated bodies and having these gears have some sort of reaction to them. And they don't have anything to say about the massive amount of civilians they see lying in the streets. Again, maybe I'm thinking about it too much and the impact of seeing random bodies should be enough, but I don't know. They come up to a street that was seemingly in the middle of a victory parade as the Pendulum Wars ended right around E-Day occurred. Baird apologizes to Paddock and he just shrugs it off. This challenge was crazy. It says more powerful locusts will appear, but it doesn't say how or exactly what those locusts are. I thought or read somewhere that it's just corpsers and serapedes, but I didn't know these serapedes were speedsters because you can't even outrun the damn things. I just used my squad as fodder and kept the distance from them because as soon as they lock onto, you're gonna die. You can also get rid of a few serapede eggs before. Even though it's not a challenge, I still assumed that not getting rid of them would lead to spawning more. Eventually make it to a door and we get another protect mission. They send out several ragers, some of which spawn enraged and some don't, as well as some other heavies like maulers. I just hate this part and I think after this I really hate ragers. I think that's all I'm going to say on this section before having an aneurysm. There's like eight bodies in here and now they're acknowledging the dead as these were people who might have thought the rooftops would have been safer from the attack. We just saw at least 30 bodies outside in the streets and in a pier yet they didn't say anything before now. You hear Marcus again requesting evac and they give the excuse for this mission again that Karn just knows that they're close so that's why they knew they had three minutes to get away from a reaver bombardment. There aren't any alarms. They had no comms that indicated that. We were just told that. There's no connection for that discovery here. They just made some shit up for this section to be three minutes. Once again, they could have at least made this make sense. Also, why are there shriekers here? They showed up in Gears of War 3. They don't need to be here. So they activate the bot, as they haven't named it yet. Cole says Jack, and Baird says Troy. I'm really glad Cole's here. Guess we know who won that debate. And the bot sneaks in completely. So I know it was a challenge technically, but even so, is the reaver bombardment just not happening anymore? Did it require Locust also being there to signal it in or something? If Karn knew y'all were close and he's literally right across the damn street, why are they safe here in the same spot? Yeah, there's way too many questions to be asking about the plot, man. It's starting to hurt my brain. Loomis comes in asking where Sophia is and she tries lying at first for whatever reason and Bear just tells him that they're about to fire the missile. Loomis tells him they do that then- I will have have you tried it? Shot! Fine. I'll see you in court. I suggest you take cover, sir. 
So how close was Omega 2, Marcus's squad, by the way, to the site? Because they didn't give them any time to clear out or let them know. They just launched. Good to know Beard almost made sure that the other Gears games would have never existed. Although I guess if it weren't for him, the other Gears games really might not have existed. They all might have died. They get spotted and have to do another horde mission against another massive assault with a huge debris cloud thanks to the missile, which was actually a cool tie-in. I enjoyed that being part of the challenge because it makes sense here. Lumus arrives and actually one second, do you know how much of an asshole you have to be to deny helping one squad, which was Marcus's squad just a few minutes ago because he just asked for Lumus's raven, to go and punish another squad for saving the day just because they had disobeyed your orders. He knocks the shit out of him and now we're all caught up. He asked him for any final words as he reached his verdict. They all give their own valid reasons on why they did what they did. Lumus nearly ends the game and Locus attack. Make quick work of these onyx cars as expected and take Lumus hostage. We don't see Locus take many people hostage so to me this would presume that the locusts know who Loomis is, otherwise they would have just shot him in the back of the head like they did the rest of the Gears. I just wish we knew anything about the locusts' intelligence in the slightest. I guess if we're playing the game through the Gears' perspective, they have no idea the amount of counterintelligence that the locusts must have, but that doesn't mean we as a player shouldn't know either. I already talked about it, but they never knew that Rom was on to them, but the game showed us. They could have showed us in a little scene that Karn knew something, but they never do. Anyways, Paddock saves him, and Loomis finally starts to see shit differently, but then he just bails, and they're left to defend themselves now. This is actually a cool transition to gameplay in the present because we knew we were going to have to play in the present at some point and I'm sure it would have been easy to predict since they've been getting attacked in between each testimony but it was still pretty cool to see. This mission of only cleavers is dumb as I just had weapons a second ago and Paddock doesn't even have one here. They see the raven they came in on and they make it their goal to get there. I'm surprised Locus haven't destroyed it by now. Also didn't realize how far they walked from the raven in the beginning. It didn't feel like they walked that far but they did a cut so that's probably why. I already talked about these exhaustion missions so I won't repeat what I said but I do like how they did them. These retro leaps are just fucking hilarious though. What is this shit? I really like this small detail of these guys being covered in blood from fighting all day and being exhausted within this challenge, but it immediately disappears when they go through the next door. Great. See, they come across yet another mass grave, this time of soldiers, as Baird says, this is the result of Loomis's grand strategy. The feeling of helplessness and despair is only felt through the brief sentence he says, the amount of dead bodies here, and ominous sounds that plays in the background. It would have added a stronger feeling and even a little more depth to these characters if we heard or even saw in a small cutscene them witnessing these bodies. Instead, all we have is Baird's one sentence and this music and then they move on. None of the other three people here, including Cole, the talkative one, has anything to say about Loomis or how these people's fate could have been different had Loomis acted differently. They get outside and everything in the surrounding area is up in flames, including the ammo supply and down near the chopper, so they need to get there in time. Loomis comes out of her room and just... This man Loomis must have unlimited ammo in his ass cheeks or something because he'd just be wasting these damn bullets. Also, this boomer came out of the ground, yet here the ground is intact now. They get to the raven and Karn does what should have been done just like 20 minutes ago and then he retreats. Loomis thinks he isn't shit and they chase after him. Anyways, screw this fight. I love this fight, but screw this fight. It's a fun fight. He just shreds so quickly with his guns. And the amount of enemies and what they were just made this exponentially difficult. You've got Therons, Ragers, Cyclops, Maulers, Grinders protecting him. And you've always got to be moving from cover to cover since Karn's beast named Shibboleth, by the way, crazy name, is always on the move and you really don't want to let that guy get an angle on you or be under him at all. He'll use Gatlings and Flames on you in the first phase until you destroy his launcher and then he'll move up on one of these structures on either side, whichever he's closest to. Then he calls for help, and thankfully they will always spawn on the opposite side of you. He'll come down after a few seconds for the second phase, and he just starts hauling towards you. There's a lot of buildup, so it's pretty easy to see coming. After charging at you, he'll start shooting diggers with Ds at you from his prosthetic leg that you'll need to shoot at the same time in order to break it. Once broken, he'll go up again and shoot Nemesis at you, and then call for more reinforcements. He'll climb back down, and Shibboleth just starts hacking emulsion bombs out of his mouth at you. Uh, I don't really know what to say here, or how that's even possible, but shoot him in the mouth, and he'll eventually fall, and he'll just start shooting at you with his bolt talk. You shoot them both down and he's finished. So there's no checkpoint for the whole fight. The enemies are mad aggressive. Your AI will fail you and he has an ass load of health. Sure, that seems fair. In all seriousness though, while it may have been the longest it ever taken me to finish a section, this is still a really enjoyable fight. Sure, it feels tough, annoyingly so, but it still seems pretty fair. You just got a lot of multitasking to do here. There's some pieces of cover that can be destroyed, only down to the crouching level, so it's still usable. If cover could have been destroyed entirely, this would have been an entirely different fight and really cool to see with an actual destruction 
destructive environment, but I wonder how much harder that would have made this fight with diminishing cover to take. Once he's down, Paddock starts to show his old colors, imagining some torture for Karn, and Loomis just comes up and ends it without a thought, which certainly felt more personal than it seems, and still showing Loomis's naivety when it comes to the Locust, because instead of thinking about the very useful information that they could have potentially gotten out of Karn, he shows that he really doesn't care, and enacting his own judgment is what matters more. He doesn't really apologize, but he just demotes Baird, drops all charges, and then tries to reconcile with Paddock, but Paddock refuses and he walks off. Sophia mentions that they were supposed to keep an eye on Paddock as they still didn't trust him through the open arms program, and they just walk off into the sunset with some light banter and bam, stat screen. Man, they could have waited for the credits to hit and then give us the stat screen. I don't know, it just throws me off here. But all in all, it was an okay campaign with an okay story, but I feel like this could have been a massive DLC, not a full price game that we paid for. It's free now if you've got Game Pass, but before this game was $60 on release, and there just isn't enough here for that much money. But we haven't even gotten through the full experience yet. Along with Gears Judgment released a campaign DLC called Aftermath. This side story takes place within the story of Gears 3. So remember after beating the Highlighter Berserker, that following day Delta decides to split up. Marcus, Dom, Jace, Dizzy, Anya, and Sam decide to go look for fuel, and Marcus tells Baird and Cole to go look for reinforcements, with Cole saying he knows of a place that they could go look. This DLC is their side of the story here. It's a short DLC, just one chapter with a few sections like the ROM DLC, and they find themselves returning to Havlo Bay just a day before the Emulsion Cure is released. So Paddock is still alive seven years later, and he's been here in Havlo Bay, apparently with some others he briefly mentions. Also, Carmine is here with us. Didn't know he'd be here with us, but it was nice that we're getting more of him since this is the only entry where there wasn't a specific Carmine. There's an emulsion rig that just washed up on shore here, which is where Paddock and his friends are at. How this got here, however, is from the sinking of Jacinto. We never got to see the ramifications of that event, so this is pretty cool to see. Paddock said the wave was 20 stories high, and keep in mind, regular tsunami waves don't normally pass 100 feet in height, and he just said that the wave that brought this in was double of that. I don't know how far Havo Bay is from Jacinto, but I wonder what other shores were heavily impacted by that sinking if this was just one effect that we've seen. Starting up this DLC just kind of felt like I was back in Gears of War 3, so much so that I tried using LB for my TACCOM again. But speaking of Gears 3, this DLC, while being within Judgment, so having the same bum-ass control scheme, it still kind of felt like a return to Gears 3. The weapons stay pretty consistent, there's no end screens telling you about the three enemies you just blew up in the last section, just straight gameplay. And it was really nice fighting Savage Locus again. I just find their design to be really cool and fascinating. And it was nice being able to see some real diggers again. So there isn't much to say about combat here. It's just going to be the exact same as we already know it. Overall, there isn't anything significantly different combat-wise. But there are ragers here. We're at the end of the Gears conflict, just a day before they're all wiped out from existence, supposedly. The ragers have only been shown in Judgment and never thereafter. So unless we're meant to believe that ragers have in fact existed this entire time, but have only inhabited areas in or near Havo Bay, their inclusion in this DLC makes absolutely no sense. Always just assume that they died out at some point in between and that's why we never saw them again, you know, other than the fact that they just weren't made for the other games. But just sticking in enemies to level out the combat sections and use the assets that they already use in the main campaign is once again just lazy. Unless I'm missing something from the books, which I'm actually reading right now, but I'm on the first one so I don't know yet, then let me know. Otherwise this is just dumb. But they're all gonna die tomorrow anyways. Although we're seeing these new locusts again, Paddock is continually saying that the locusts don't attack him when he cuts through this area. And we get the sense that these locusts attacking aren't normally around here as Paddock kind of initially blames Baird for possibly endangering his group since he mentions locusts haven't been around here in months. Arrive at his camp and he hasn't yet stated who these people are, but we can at least infer that they probably aren't one of us, like the cog. They aren't here outside or anywhere that we can see, just an empty looking camp. Paddock stresses that they're not stranded, just people who fight for themselves. You see a group of people that ended their own lives, probably to avoid whatever caused the mass silence outside. You start hearing some familiar noises, the power turns off when it's not supposed to, and in come some formers. I guess now we know what happens to Paddock's people, unfortunately. We never even knew if they came across these guys before the end of the conflict the following day, but now we can see that they had their own reactions to this phenomenon. They still say those same voice lines, but I always wondered why they just disintegrate rather than explode like the locusts do. Is it because human bodies are different and just have different reactions? Probably good that they don't explode, otherwise it would be annoying not to die to. Also really like that it kind of feels like a horror house again in here. Kind of gives me some Gears of 1 nostalgia around here. They go to check if there are any more survivors at the top of the rig, and they come across a voice recording at the top. And a person on the recording says that they realized that the sickness was spreading after an emulsion leak, so they moved offshore after 150 people lost their lives. They then say if you're listening, then head back to the main deck and 
fire a flare gun. So guess what you guys are gonna do next? Fire the very obvious flare from your position and you get a response flare, but the locusts get to you first. Defend from them and formers alike and Paddock's friends come to pick you all up. The pilot says everyone's holed up at Seahorse Hills and Paddock says he's gonna help his friends first. I love this because if you remember the name, Seahorse Hills is the rich area that we went through that Paddock said he'd come to reclaim once things settle down. And he really did. Paddock mentions that they're gonna need explosives and then shows us where the boat is and that explains everything. Baird finally asks about Sophia since she's the only one we haven't seen yet and he says he'll tell them after they're finished here. So she's probably not alive. Cole and Paddock really seem to like trucks for bridges for some reason. I don't think I realized this was an ongoing gag until this part. Baird just now realizes that Paddock hasn't asked what they need this help for. He's just helping a friend and it didn't really matter to him what it was. They tell him something big is coming and he replies- of dawn strikes? As big as when you sank Jacinto and flooded my coast? Bigger. Great. Which, considering Gears 4 and 5, Paddock isn't wrong, but until then. This section with one-shots and snipers trained on you, and now you have to maneuver through these adjacent buildings is a pretty well-designed level area. I just found it pretty fun to comb through. and felt like playing Gears 1 or Gears 2 again. We also come up to a memorial that calls Loomis a hero for saving and protecting Havo Bay. I guess the story is always different for the people who weren't there. Get to the building with the boat on top and start setting the charges with a cool little mini game, and then start defending the building. Once finished, Anya contacts them, and this is their side of the conversation. When we got the sub ready at the end of the fourth act. With them unaware of Dom's passing yet, Cole could still tell something was wrong. They blow the bombs up, but it doesn't work now, so they're heading to the top to cross over to the boat, and this was pretty funny. I thought we were about to walk the entire way up. They arrive to the top. This man gets obliterated just for existing, and these guys get blamed yet again for Locus's attacks. Reach the top, cross over to the boat, and then go down to the restaurant in the same building with increasing Locus forces, and it's at this point you should start picking up by now that the Locus are definitely tracking you guys, the same way that they are tracking Marcus and crew in the third game. Paddock already mentioned that Locus have haven't shown up here in months, and these stranded here also blame them for the locusts appearing. You even fight armored cantus here, who, as far as we know, are only under the queen's direct order, so it's highly likely they're just being followed. Also weird that no one has a reaction to the armored cantus. Marcus and the group saw them for the first time just minutes before they got here, yet no one says anything about their appearance except Paddock, who I assume is just doing the AI thing of calling out an enemy type in the area, because I highly doubt he's seen one either. After opening all the gas lines, Baird shoes everyone out for a crazy ass plan of just blowing up the place, and we get an epic zip line ride as the boat falls to the water and you all shoot the gondolas in front of you in order not to die. Baird explains that they're going to get rid of all the locusts and Paddock says that he's done fighting and just wants to let them have the planet. I didn't say it earlier but he was just telling Baird to fight his own fight rather than fighting in someone else's war. Something Paddock has been practicing for a while now and he finally tells us Sophia's fate. You want to know what happened to Sophia? Kidnapped while she was out on patrol. I watched it happen through my scope. I was only able to kill one of them. He dropped these. You want to stay friends? Let's never see each other again. So we don't know who exactly kidnapped her, but we could just assume that the Locust did, and if that's the case, that means her fate must be similar to Ty and Maria's, so that's pretty gruesome. Got rid of Sophia really quickly. Can't say I felt much about it other than Paddock being upset, but these guys don't even seem shaken by these news. Maybe because they've lost so much up to this point, but I would expect Sophia to mean something a little more to these guys. The fight at the end isn't really memorable, and that goes for most of the combat sequences in this DLC. This DLC is really just catching us up on what these dudes were dicking off with, but nothing really significant happened here on their own adventure quite like Marcus's side. All they did was come up to Halvo, shoot through scores and waves of enemies for a few hours, and discovered the Lambent themselves. And also discovered the Ragers still existed, and decided not to even mention it, which really bothers me. Like I said earlier, I would have accepted the fact that Ragers did go extinct everywhere besides the Havo Bay area if it were explained or these guys ever said anything about it. Maybe they could have added some more to their armor that resembled the armor of the Savage Locust, but nope, they look the same as they did 17 years ago. They leave with their boat, Baird and Cole have a cute little moment, and join up at Azura. Paddock's view on this war and life as a whole is really intriguing to me as he, just like Griffin and his late citizens, wanted nothing to do with a war that seems to just take and take and take and these guys, the cog, who they all blame collectively, seems to keep making things worse despite having a greater goal of ending all the locusts and we know they succeed but like I said with Gears 4 and 5 on the horizon, things may not be as they seem. Going into this game, I really wanted to start off defending it, saying the story is great, the multiplayer modes were okay for what they gave us and that the weapon changes weren't that bad but there's just too much in this game for me to overlook 
look and recommend for someone else to play. I could recommend the campaign if you like a challenge with the declassified missions, but from a story perspective, you really could just watch a YouTube video for this. Well, I guess you just did, huh? There also just weren't many memorable experiences in this game. Gears 1 had that eerie atmosphere and ROM. Gears 2 had the worm, Scourge, the Lambent Brumach, and the Flood. Gears 3 had, well, the whole damn game was memorable for Gears 3. There isn't anything that happened or that was that significant that made me excited playing this game. It's challenging, but it's not really that exciting. Those are really the only things I would recommend this game for. The multiplayer is most certainly dead. There's no horde mode. Survival mode is boring, and Overrun is fun for a couple games, and you'll get bored of that one too eventually, especially with other good horde modes that people continue playing to this day. This game not having horde really did hurt it, because survival and Overrun aren't like horde, no matter how you try to look at them. They're both much quicker. You don't get to decide where to set up, like on a multiplayer map, nor are there even many maps to begin with, since these are map-specific modes. As for maps, they didn't have many multiplayer maps for this game either, just gondola and yeah, whatever these other ones are. As they skimped on multiplayer maps, so did they with usable characters. Sure, many gears weren't in this entry with just the four, Loomis and some Onyx cards, but they still took out the Locust, so it still cut down the amount by at least half. Not having Locust just felt so weird, and removing down but not out was just bizarre. Back to the story, even excluding the missions for now, the story really doesn't captivate me enough for a playthrough of it. The game just wasn't worth $60 back then. It wasn't worth the time to actually play through for so little of a story unless you want to burn your time on the missions, and for people to care about playing this game, there would need to be more of a reason to play other than getting upset with the game's story mode as most of the multiplayer died pretty swiftly within the first few months. Hell, I really don't remember playing that much. I'm only level 47. Like, I, I really didn't care to play this game. The story had an interesting premise, and it's what they tried marketing towards us the most. Set in a time period most Gears fans know nothing about, focusing on Baird, a fan favorite with his witty and sarcastic attitude and how he's going to be the hero who ultimately saves the day but needs to break some or several rules along the way. But when you actually get in the game and figure out most of the game is told entirely in flashback, and then on top of that, it starts to feel like more of a bullet fest and real combat heavy and having less story beats, you realize that you maybe could have saved your time and money watching a Let's Play. If you put all cutscenes together for this game, you can watch it all back to back in less than 20 minutes. I'm looking at cutscene YouTube videos for this. That's shorter than all cutscenes for just the first act in Gears of War 3. Just the first act alone has more cutscenes than the entire story of this game. And this was $60 on release. For some reason, the person who uploaded this cutscene video also left in the credits, and unfortunately it helps my case. Credits are 9 minutes long. That's almost half the time of the damn cutscenes for the entire story. This isn't including the Aftermath DLC, but that's really just a couple more minutes. So while this story had an interesting premise, this could have all been DLC. Out of these characters, the only ones we have come to understand better is Loomis and Paddock, whereas Baird, Sophia, and Cole were kind of just left behind. Baird's testimony was a great start to the campaign. We see them arrested and on trial, introduced to Karn, and find out their plans to take him down. But from Sophia's testimony and onwards, it was just mostly a gameplay fest. After Baird's section, each one after has a little scene back at the courtroom, something happens outside, and Loomis is like, talk. Then you're playing again through an entire section with zero story elements in it. Sure, we hear that Sophia is an Onyx cadet, and that she really liked her professor, but that's it, and now she's dead, or presumed dead. Her character was initially interesting, as we've never gotten to know an Onyx guard before. They've just been shadow elites of the cog to us. But we were given so little about her, and made it hard to care. I really just cared that Paddock was upset about her passing, not necessarily herself. Speaking of Paddock, his section didn't have much for him either, but at least through the whole story, he actually speaks, so we get more of him than the others. We knew he was Garazny from the UIR, we know he wasn't the most moral of people, and he certainly tortured POWs, and he's been burned by Karn and the Cog alike. Oh, and that he also wanted to live in the mansions. But because he actually had more lines and interactions from him, we know what kind of a person he is and his characteristics, which help his character tremendously, especially in Aftermath, so it's no wonder he's many people's favorite. And we didn't even hear anything from Cole in his own section. Just that some drunk general let him in one of the most classified places within the Cog, just because he was a pro athlete. Yes, that shows how the Cog isn't necessarily the greatest government, but we got nothing out of Cole in his own section, and for the rest of the game, he has very little dialogue aside from funny one-liners. He was just a playable character for the sake of having him here. We do get the sense that he really doesn't like Loomis, but since he only mentions him in one line, we never hear anything more as to maybe why, other than the disrespect he shows for Thrashball. With Baird, I mean, he's the main character, but this story doesn't necessarily add any more context to his character for me. He's already someone that seems like they wouldn't follow rules or challenge his authority. We got that from the first game. Only thing we get is that he is or was a good leader, but nothing learned from his character. He's also portrayed a bit nicer in his game. Like, he's kind of a dickhead in the first game, and a second, and a third. Just a snarky asshole, but he's less of a snarky asshole in this game. Loomis felt like someone with some actual depth. A commander who was clearly a high and well-respected leader, but just cannot switch from his old ways. He feels superior because his own war experience that puts him in a high seat compared to these four gears, yet they did the job he's been trying so hard to get done 
spend all day, which is taking down Karn and saving the city. Instead, he just gets most of his Onyx soldiers killed in the process, since he isn't able to see that the Locusts aren't just genocidal monsters, but a greater threat that requires him to rethink his own strategies. Distrusting of the very people that saved his own life until the very end. And even after the fact, he still lost his life protecting Halva Bay and gets recognized as a hero for it. But if we look at how many soldiers he's responsible for, and how many of them died under his command, well, the word hero wouldn't really fit here. I bring up these characters in their respective developments because this game seems as if its goal was to help characterize the people involved more for us. Gears 1, 2, and 3, it's mostly centered on Dom and Marcus. We get to know more about Cole later on and can understand what kind of a person Baird is, but it's mostly on the main two. Being able to play with each character in this game gave the illusion of being able to connect more with the character, but it didn't really help anything and doesn't even seem necessary. Take Rom's shadow, for example. We know who Kim is from the first game, but in that DLC, we even get a little more on who he is. His authoritarian views show multiple times, even in just a little conversations like at the school, but we also get to know that he isn't the most aware leader, nor is he above vengeance. This DLC gave us more context about his characters, even Valera, rather than these guys, and once again, this is a full price game. But I'm also bringing up characterization more, because as we're getting closer to Gears 4 and 5, I think those things will matter a lot by the time we get to Gears 5. The complaint of that game is that its characters weren't given much development in between games, therefore no one really cared about them that much, making that final decision in Gears 5 feel really pointless. And that's what I'll be assessing myself upon playing those games again. I liked Gears 4 for its multiplayer, while its story was okay, but it felt like a good start to another trilogy. But then Gears 5 came, and I think I'll hold my thoughts on that game until we get there. Especially since I've only played that campaign once. It's the only Gears game where I haven't gone back and replayed it multiple times. And that should say enough, but we will definitely get there. But back to this game, for its story, I just feel like there wasn't enough of an actual story to warrant a full game for it. It feels like they stuff a lot of gameplay in between the minimal story they gave us in comparison and gave us the classified missions for slightly more engaging gameplay to make up for it. These missions weren't all that bad. If anything, they could have been a decent step in the right direction, even though some were just repeats or boring or just frustrating altogether. Although despite these changes within a story with what little exposition, little character development or depth, little cutscenes and just transitions, and just feeling arcadey overall, I don't think that's what killed off the population for this game. In fact, most people like the story, myself included, until I decided to look deeper into it. Doesn't mean it's a shit story, it just doesn't feel like it's a full one. I think what really killed this game and why it feels like this game really failed its fan base were the huge weapon changes, multiplayer changes, and a removal of horde mode. Every change they did tried taking away from what makes Gears games Gears in the first place and tried making it appeal to a more Call of Duty crowd. Quicker button swapping, quick grenade toss, less weapons, no locus in multiplayer, no horde, just a couple of subpar game modes. Yes, Overrun is good, but it's not horde mode or even beast mode really. There were just too many changes and issues in this game for it to be an enjoyable experience compared to the others. The campaign can be fun to play through. It is one giant arcade run, but people tend to want other modes to make them stick around playing the game, and this game didn't offer that at all. I spent all that time talking about the story just to show that even the story seemed to take too many steps and changes away from the Gears formula. Do I think Gears Judgment is a terrible game? Uh, no, I won't say terrible, but it's hard for me to say it was a great game either because it really could have done a lot more. Like I said, I didn't want to be negative about this game because I just love Gears, but there isn't anything redeeming about it multiplayer modes, and depending on what you want from a campaign, neither does the story. The Aftermath DLC is refreshing as it didn't have any of the main campaign's issues gameplay-wise, and story-wise it was a bit more engaging for me, despite it being so short and still having some issues itself. I think with more thought-out changes over time, this game would have served as more of a push in a different direction, as it feels like Epic Games and People Can Fly wanted to try taking the Gear series in a different direction, and Judgment was the start of that direction shift. But since this game didn't sit well with the Gears community, and all those changes were removed come Gears 4, because we switched over to the coalition, we'll never know what their plans were, and the game sort of feels like the unrecognized bastard child of the series. It had some innovative ideas with Overrun, telling the story from a different perspective, giving us a story in a time where we haven't seen much in the games, the declassified missions with some added difficulty and frustration, and even giving us some gritty elements we missed from the first game. But those things were just overshadowed heavily by all the drastic changes they made, the story issues and inconsistencies and everything else I've already mentioned several times in this long ass video. One thing I have yet to mention is the music. I do really enjoy the music in this game, with the older game's melody mixed in with the epic guitar. I also think the graphics for this game are really good. There's more details in their armor, their faces, and the colors in the game, like at these locations, all look so vibrant and really pretty to look at. And they still carry that feeling of despair. You know, I don't even know what a remaster would do for it either, as we're all anticipating one for these four games. Better graphics is just going to have us wanting to play the story mode for a little bit and maybe play Overrun a few times, but other than that, most people will still likely find themselves on the other entries. But thanks for tuning in into another one of these super long videos. I'm just making these for fun now because I like hyper analyzing the things I love. So I appreciate those who care to hear what I've got to say. We've got a couple entries
use any Gears franchise left. So soon we'll take some deeper looks to see whether the Coalition has doomed the Gears franchise and its fans alike, or it's just trying another direction shift like Judgment did. But until then, everyone, thanks again, and peace out.